The Lord's Prayer is what we're looking at. Our Father who art in heaven, Adam unpacked that last week. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins and we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is how I memorize it. Is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to take seven or eight weeks to, 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 to focus on and soak in that prayer. As Pastor Adam so powerfully unpacked the last few weeks, the, the teaching power of Jesus and his ability to condense galactic truths into a few sentences, right? Obviously, a gift that neither Adam nor I have. We take lots of words to say very few things. Jesus says lots of things with very few words. And one of the things that I want to invite us to reflect on this morning is why these four words, hallowed be your name, let's consider it for a moment. In the Bible, we have hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of words. Every sermon I preach, we transcribe between eight to 10,000 words with gusts up to 12. Adam preaches at about 20, I think. Okay? I mean, just, just, just words, words, words. And we get to the Lord's Prayer. And in the English language, depending on your translation and what version you look at in, in the Gospel Corpus, about 53, on average, 53 English words. Jesus condensing the topic of prayer, the theology of prayer, the practice of prayer, down to 53 words. And, and, and in, in some ways, I've often thought, why didn't he give us more? And then upon reflection and preparation for the sermon, I thought, my goodness, he's so amazing he gave us so little. Because if he had given us 17, you know, Lord, teach us to pray, no problem. Boom, 17 volumes on how to pray. I'm paid to be a Christian, and I wouldn't read it. Do you know what I mean? It's like, like, like ah, no. He's like, oh, teach us to pray? Sure. 53 words. Here it is. It's short. It con it's concise. It's simple. It's concentrated. And in it, we have a framework for us to work from. But the question I want us to reflect on this morning is, how would be your name? Why these four words? Our Father, who art in heaven, how would be thy name? And it can feel like kind of preamble. Like, like okay, 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 okay. When do we get to the part where I ask him to help me win the lottery ticket? Our Father, who art in heaven, how, why these four words? And it's my prayer and my hope that at the end of this sermon, these four words will reframe how you see all of life for the rest of your life. A few weeks ago, I had a few boys at our house. It was a little man card uh, group in cor correlation with Stronger Man Nation. I got a few dads with some sons, my oldest boy's age, and I said, hey, what if we intentionally got together, challenged each other, learned from each other, and challenged our boys to step into man? And we define manhood as the, the willingness, readiness, and ableness, right, to joyfully step into privilege and greatness of doing your job in the service of others no matter the cost. That's our def working definition of manhood, and we want to help our boys grow into that as we, as dads, grow into that as well. And so we got a few of our boys together for the last two, three years. We've been doing intentional kind of rite of passage stuff. And we'll, quarter by quarter, year by year, summer by summer, we'll set out challenges, intellectual, mental, emotional, physical, spiritual, vocational, financial challenges that, that they set goals for themselves. And then we help them walk into, we want to help them be boys that learn to define manhood as as the process of increasingly taking more responsibility for themselves and those around them, blah, 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 blah. You know all that. Go to the comments if you missed it or read the book that's going to come out sometime before I die, hopefully. Anyways, here's the point. This summer, we're taking them. One of our challenges is a 22-mile hike. And we're going to get dropped in at one place, and we're going to, we're going to scramble 22 miles to a, 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 our destination. And so we gather the boys several times start talking about orienteering. Right? The sport, the discipline, the practice of orienteering. And it consists of two things. How to figure out where you are and how to determine how to get where you want to go. Very simple. And so we, we, we break out the topo maps and Uncle Eric, who's there with the boys, and Uncle Eric and I worked six summers in the Forest Service doing, traversing all sorts of stuff, doing boundary line adjustments and, and cadastral landline surveying. So spent six summers out in the National Forest climbing hills and mountains and trees where nobody had been for years and years and years. And so we had to learn how to use a compass and declination and the whole thing and, and work with the topo map. And so Uncle Eric was taking to the boys kind of the, the basic foundations of orienteering. And as he's talking to them, it was just this wonderful, wonderful time of going, you can take a topo map, you can get dropped into the woods, not have a clue where you are, be blindfolded, take the blindfold off, and with a map and a compass, 
You can both A, determine where you are, and B, determine you can get yourself to an X on the map with, it, with a precision of, you know, three square feet, which is what we used to do all the time. Go find this corner. No one's been there since 1942. It's got this landmark, this landmark, this landmark. Go find it. And that's what we did for six summers. It was a blast. And so we laid out the map and started talking to the boys about reference points and bearing points and compass and true north and magnetic north and declination on your compass and declination on the map and longitude and latitude and blah, 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 blah. Well, what we taught them to do is, if, let's say you get dropped off right here, but you don't know where you're at. You're going to need to start looking for reference points that you can visually identify in front of you and then find them on the map. Things like mountaintops, creek beds, intersections of creek beds, these, these things and such, so on and so forth. So you find a reference point. Okay, that's one. Boom, shoot a compass bearing. Now find that reference point. Boom, shoot a compass bearing. One more, one more, boom, compass bearing. Now you're going to triangulate those bearings, and that is where you are at, first half of the job done. You now know where you are at in relationship to where you want to go. Okay, now if that's where you want to go, okay, now we're going to start shooting compass bearings. Uh, the best path to take, is that a cliff? Is that a creek? Is that a lake? How are we going to go around it, or over it, and through it to get to where we want to go? And you start charting a course from there. But you can't get to where you want to go until you first figure out where you are at. The sport, the discipline, the practice of orienteering. Here's how I want you to think of the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer gives us bearing points for soul orienteering. Each line in this power-packed, condensed prayer is Jesus helping you and I orient ourselves so that we can figure out where we are at and where we fit in the universe so that we can more confidently know how to get where we have been designed to go. This is what I mean. Our father, okay, he's dad, he's papa, he's near, he's close, who art in heaven, okay, he's sovereign over all. Boom, boom, bearing points. Hallowed be your name. Very helpful, bearing point. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. And pretty soon, these lines are, are, are allowing us to triangulate where we are at in relationship to reality so that we can then know what to ask for and where to go. The Lord's Prayer gives us bearing points for soul orienteering. So here's the two bearing points that he gives us in this phrase, hallowed be your name. And I typically have sermons with 19, 20, 30 points. Only going to give you two this morning. No way. You're right. There's more points, actually. So, so I was just totally kidding. I have sub points to my sub points to the sub points. And you're going to love them. Get ready to take notes. Here we go. Number one, hallowed be your name realigns our hearts with God's nature and ultimate reality. This is a big deal. Hallowed be your name realigns our hearts with God's nature and ultimate reality. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Worthy is your name. Revered is your name. Worshipped is your name. And this word hallowed has this sense of, 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 of holy awe and dread. And I can think of no better text that can help our soul tap into what I think Jesus is trying to unpack for us here than Revelation chapter 4. Because when Jesus gives this prayer and utters these words, to his disciples, this picture in Revelation 4 is in his head. Because see, what Jesus is doing is he's communicating with words. He's engaging the minds of the disciples, but he knows it will be recorded for all of time so that people who live in Monitor, Washington in 2022 will read it, and he's wanting to give them bearing points that will help their the orienteering need for their soul to know where they are at and which way to go 2,000 years later, and these are the words he chooses to do that with. Hallowed be your name. Revelation chapter 4, we get a story, the accounting of John, the revelator. Now, John um, uh, it was this guy that culture tried to cancel. They tarred and feathered him, and uh, they quarantined him and closed him and shut him down and canceled him to an island. And he's out there, and, he's, and he's, this is how successful the culture 
was at the time to cancel Jesus and his word, he writes a letter and 2,000 years later, we're still reading it. <laughs> you know, congratulations, cancel culture. Fail, you can't, culture the kingdom of, you can't cancel the kingdom of God, right? You, you can't do it. So John's on this island, been tarred and feathered. He's been banished and canceled and quarantined on this island. He's writing an epistle, because it's a letter, that's prophetic and, and apocalyptic in nature. It's telling of the future and how the world will end. And in chapter 4, he gives us this account that will help us get at what Jesus means when he says God's name is holy and we should hallow it. Chapter 4, verse 1. After this, I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit. And there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Ruby. There's a lot of, a lot of vivid imagery in the Revelation of John because he's trying to liken what he's seeing to something we can reference as familiar so as to know what he's saying. He, He's, he's seen something that is so far beyond human experience or human origin that he's, he's, he's straining human vocabulary and experience to articulate what he's seen. It's sort of like, it's kind of like, in reference to what you know here, that's what I'm seeing there. He's straining human experience and vocabulary to say it's like this. And he says, the one who sat on the throne had the appearance of Jasper and Ruby. A rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. So this is, this is bright, this is shining, this is royalty, this is color, this is spectacular, this is like, you know, California Adventure light show. God's throne. I mean, it's just like, it's, what that is like in shadow, this is in substance. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white, so pure, there's purity here, and had crowns of gold on their head. Royalty, power, value, richness. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. This is no ordinary king's throne. It's not, oh, cute little king on a nice little throne, this is terrifying being on this massive throne with boom, bolts of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder, not over or around the throne, but coming from the throne itself. Originating from that being is this terrifying thunder. Have you ever had a thundercloud roll over your puny, pathetic, finite little self and just unload Boom! You feel like a gnat. And this, this is not just some local monitor thunderstorm. This is a heavenly galactic thunderstorm originating from the throne as its power source. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. So don't picture candle Twinkle, 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 twinkle. You know, seven cams were wicking. Seven, what does it say? Lamps were blazing like, like. <laughs> I can't do it. I mean, like, like, you know, like volcano stuck on on. You know, straight up. <laughs> you know, just craziness. These are the seven spirits of God. Also in front of the throne were what was looked like a sea of, what does it say? Glass, clear as crystal. I mean, so this, this amazing picture of lights and color and sound and flashes of lightning and then, it, and then the face that's radiating. And then in front of that is this ocean. And one of the things that, that water does in nature that's so beautiful is it reflects beauty. Have you ever seen those pictures or puzzles of like two mountains, you know, one upside down and the other, and it's like, what, what, what? Wait a minute, what, wait a minute. That's a lake. <laughs> you read those moments? You're like, ah. 
You know, and, and the stillness of the water reflects the image of the majesty before it, and, and, and it magnifies the majesty of the, of, of the object it's, it's before. And in Revelation, anytime there's water around the throne, it is all still as glass, signifying peace. Because then all throughout the Bible, whenever there's water and storms, rolling storms, that's, that's evil, that's danger, that's bad news. And before the throne of God, no bad news, no danger, only peace, a crystal clear sea like glass there to magnify the radiance of the beauty of the one it's before. We, we have some friends visiting from the East Coast, and we were taking them around last weekend, or this weekend, and, and came over the mountains to, to Chelan, and oh, went like that. I'm like, what was that? Oh, everything okay? Yeah, the lake. Yeah, Lake Chelan. You know what they said? It's blue. I was like, yeah, it's water. I mean, like, where have you been? You know what I mean? Like, like blue lake. And I was like, isn't your water blue? They're like, no, our lakes are brown. And I'm like, you need to move. You know what I mean? Like, that's, that's, I was like, that's weird. Our waters look blue. And they're like, you can see, you know, you can see in it. Yeah, it's water, you know? And, and she's like, you can't see your feet. And, and I'm like, I wouldn't swim in that. I want to see danger approaching before I die. I don't want to just die, you know? There, so like, like, take like the, the most crystal clear alpine lake you've ever seen, magnify it times infinity, and you're getting a taste of what is before this throne. In the center around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. Now this is where it starts to get Wild. The first living creature was like, like, like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man. The fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under their wings. These are, we know, the Bible tell, teaches, these are the seraphim that surround the throne. They've been made by God and designed with a purpose, and that is to serve in his immediate presence for eternity with one job, and that is to declare to the universe who God is. They didn't make it up on their own. They didn't write their own script. He gave them what to say. And they have six wings, and with two wings, they're covering their face to protect their lion-like face from being melted off by the heat and radiance coming off the glory of God. And with two wings, they covered their feet to cover the sign of creatureliness, not worthy to stand in the presence of the one who is not creature. And with two wings, they fly. And these things, when they unfurl their wings, boom, one wing would disappear over the horizon that way, and boom, one wing would disappear over the horizon that way. These are large, terrifying beings. And day and night, they never stop saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was, who is, and who is to come. And that is the script they've been given to declare to the universe for eternity. And they do it well because they were made for it. This is a gigantic scene made to terrify us, made to thrill us, made to humble us, made to reorient us to God's nature and ultimate reality. I had a chance to travel to Paris this summer, as some of you know, the spring with my wife on our 20th anniversary on a World War II tour. It was epic. It was awesome. It was amazing. We landed in, in, in Paris, and we, we went to see the, the Eiffel Tower. And if you're walking through the Eiffel Tower, if you've been there before, you know that you, ca you can see it from a long way off. And so you know, we're walking, do do, <gasps> honey, 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 there it is, like a little kid. You see, boop, see the top, through a tree, behind a building, through an alley, walk, walk, another window. There it is, the middle of it. And, and you can see pieces of it as you walk. And then you come on the corner, and you're like, oh, there it is. And, and what you were seeing in pieces, you now see in full. And the closer you get, the bigger it becomes. And then you walk underneath it, and now it's just, it's just raw, impressive. You're, you're, you're like, my goodness, with hardly any modern technology and no hydraulics, they built this thing in two years. 
just a testimony of the ingenuity of man and the lack of government bureaucracy at the time. Anyways, that's another conversation. <laughs> you know that was good, and somebody should have said amen. Anyways, <laughs> what man can do when people who make up rules for no reason get out of the way? Anyways, um, yes, that comes from a deep place of hurt. Anyways, uh, we're, we're under the, the, the Eiffel Tower, and, 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 you're, and you're looking around, and there's a leg here, and a leg there, and a leg there, and a leg there, and you're under it, and you're like, I thought it was big, and now I'm underneath it, and my thought has been confirmed. It's huge, and you're staring up underneath it, and you're like, this thing, how in the, what? Wow! Now picture walking outside here after church, and you get your little, your little summer treat, and your little chocolate bar, and your little bottle of water, and you're feeling kind of warm. And, and, and you look over, and, and coming from somewhere, you know, 10,000 miles north of Chelan is a huge leg. And then somewhere, you know, coming out of the Seattle area, hopefully on top of it, is another huge egg. I'm kidding. And then someone from the south is a huge egg, leg, huge egg, no, huge leg. In the east, another huge leg. And then 60,000 miles above the surface of the grass out here, you look up, and it's, it's the bottom of what you are being told is a footstool because the Bible tells us that the earth is like God's footstool. And then you follow the leg that's on the footstool over to somewhere north of the Milky Way galaxy and there is a throne there. And then around that throne is these giant like Avenger-esque seraphim and the words they are thundering are shaking the foundations of heaven which are not easy to shake. And if you were to have heaven open and that window given to you to see that, your response would not be, that's cool. <laughs> right? Everywhere in Scripture, when man is given a window into absolute reality, they are undone. They are made to lay bare before God. They fall on their face. And that is what it means to be holy. When the seraphim are declaring that he is holy, 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 they, they are declaring to the world the essence of God's nature. We are now right at the center of who God is. So the first thing we see in the text is that God's nature is holy, holy, holy. In that God is absolutely unique in his moral perfection and infinitely powerful permanence. I tried to make a, a definition. This, I, I'm condensing 10 sermons in that sentence. I got to go fast here and ah, if we could unpack that word by word. Here's what I mean. When the seraphim say, holy, 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 three things signal that this is different than anything else we would describe God as. Number one, it's the first thing they say about him. And order implies importance. It's the first thing in the order of things they're going to say about God, which means it's the most important thing they could say about him. Number two, it's raised to the thrice degree, as old R.C. Sproul would say. And whenever repetition was given to a word, it gets increasingly important. To say it once, it means it's important. To say it twice, it's a big deal. To say it three times is to say this is absolute. And nowhere in Scripture do we see anyone refer to God as, or him refer to himself as, love, love, love. Gracious, gracious, gracious. Kind, kind, kind. Faithful, faithful, faithful. God is holy, 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 meaning the essence and nature, the very center of his being is his otherness, is his holiness, is his moral perfection and infinitely powerful permanence as the only holy being. And from his holiness flows all of his other virtues and character. His love is holy. His mercy is holy. His justice is holy is holy. His kindness and his grace are holy. And one of the problems that's seeping into, not seeping into, marching through the evangelical church in America is that we have taken independent and individual virtues and characteristics of God and we have severed them from the essence and nature of God that is holy. Oh, God is love. And then I get to define love, which means I'm, I'm making a God in my own image which is idolatry, which a holy God will crush and punish on the day of judgment. When we separate the virtues and characteristics of God from the essence and nature of God, they cease to be of God. 
He is holy, holy, holy. Now, if I were to ask you to give a 67 dissertation on holiness, could you do it? And the reason most of you could, including myself, is because it, it, holiness is hard to get at and hard to describe because the very definition of holiness is that it's, it's other. In, in Isaiah 40, verse 45, I have it here. To whom then will you compare me, God says, that I should be like him, says the Holy One. And it's a rhetorical question to say, there's no one to compare me to because no one is in a category like I am. I am in a category unto myself. Who can you compare me, says the Lord, the Holy One. Oh wait, he's holy, so you can't because no one and nothing is holy outside of God himself. That makes him absolutely unique in his moral perfection and infinitely powerful permanence. When we pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It's not preamble to get us to the important stuff where we ask him to give us bread for the day. It's reorienting our soul to get in line with the nature of the one in whom we pray to and the nature of absolute reality we live inside of. Otherwise, we'll start creating many false realities that we live inside of, that we prop up as real, that can be fun for a few hours, days, weeks, months, or even years, but one day we'll be stepped on and crushed to be brought back in line with ultimate reality that flows from the throne of God as being the world he made. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Number two, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was. This phrase lets us in on God being the only uncreated reality. Meaning that, that God is the only uncaused cause. He's the only uncreated being. They cover their feet as creatures because they're not worthy as creatures to stand before the one who is not creature. Everything in your life and in your field of reference, you can trace lineage to origin from the person sitting next to you to the chair they're sitting in next to you has some origin in a creator somewhere. No chair, idea, industry, commerce, economy, chair. No person, husband, wife, person. I left out some details there. Ask your parents. <laughs> Everything in our world from this building to your brain, you can trace a lineage to a point of origin. You cannot do the same with the one who is completely other in a category of being, namely uncreated. Martin Luther, when he was, he'd been ordained and he had a church now. Of course, he'd been, he'd been making war with the papacy and the government because they had come together, church and state had joined together to oppress the people tyrannically. And he was fighting against that theologically because the theology of the Bible leads to liberty in society. And so he's, he's, he's combating that and he comes to the table to give communion for the first time and he gets to the communion table. This is Martin Luther, the great reformer, the guy who wrote volumes and volumes and volumes of books that I'm not even smart enough to read, let alone write. He comes to the communion table, and he absolutely freezes. Humili humiliates his family, embarrasses his friends. The whole thing ends in an awkward silence. He, he, he walks off. And these are the only words he was able to utter at the communion table for the inaugural giving of the sacrament of communion. We offer unto thee the living, the true, the eternal God. He mumbles these words leaves. Later he would write in an explanation to his church, at these words, I was utterly stupefied and terror stricken. I thought to myself, with what tongue shall I address such a majesty, seeing that all men ought to tremble in the presence of even an earthly prince? Who am I that I should lift up my eyes or raise my hands to the divine majesty, the angels surround him at his nod, the earth trembles. And shall I, a miserable little pygmy, say, I want this, or I demand that, for I am dust and ashes and full of sin, and I am speaking to the living, eternal, and true God. That's holiness. That's otherness. That's proper response before the God who sits in the throne that thunderbolts are firing from. 
who was. God is the only uncreated reality. This is where, and follow with me closely, this is where the biblical mindset and the mindset of the flesh clash. What marks the flesh mindset is not that they do not acknowledge the Bible to be true or not even necessarily that they don't acknowledge that there is a God. Rather, the mark of the fleshly mindset is that man is the center of all things. Man's needs and man's rights are the measure of all things. It's how we define problems. It's how we define success. Man is the center of all things. Over and against the biblical mindset that says God is the center of all things because God presupposes all things. So when we get our shorts in a bunch in current cultural issues, oftentimes it's because we're demanding our creature rights that we perceive we are owed in this sub alter reality world we've created, and then we whine and complain and blog and tweet and sue and march and protest because we've lost sight of the reality of the creator who has ultimate rights to define and orient everything. All of the arguments, all of the culture wars, all of the conversations, if you listen, if you have eyes to see and ears to hear from a biblical mindset, are people demanding that their opinions and their rights and their perspective and their orientation and their thoughts on any given subject become ultimate reality for everyone else around them, which is idolatry pretending to be God when you're not. And what this heavenly scene does is it, it reclaims our orientation. It reorients our heart to the divine nature of God in absolute reality, namely the one who defines all things is the one who was before all things. Do you ever hear anyone advocating for creator rights? Well, before we consider this, uh, this trial, before we consider this legislative act, let us consider the rights of the one who, oh, I don't know, made all of this. How might he speak into this process? How might he call us to live? Let's consider the rights of the one who actually has some before we consider demanding our own. Interesting, Exodus 3. The people of Israel are in captivity and God's going to set them free. They're being oppressed by Pharaoh, which is one man given ultimate power over, over a people group. Wake up, Washingtonians. Anyways, <laughs> we're living in a biblical scene, you know. One man given ultimate power, people group, oppression. What do you know? They're there. God says, I'm going to set you free. He tells Moses, you're my prophet. Go tell Pharaoh where to get off, essentially. Go tell him to find a crisp, clear blue lake to jump in, you know. So Moses goes, uh, Pharaoh, Pharaoh, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, um, No. And Moses says, well, uh, you need to or else. And Pharaoh's like, you know, I like minimum wage right now for my workforce, free. And uh, I'm going to keep them. And oh, by the way, who are you? And on whose behalf are you speaking? You know what Moses says? Because see, God had anticipated Pharaoh asking that. And so Moses says, well, I actually have an answer. He told me to tell you when you asked that question because he knew you'd ask it because he's fine out and you're not. You should be scared. He said to tell you, I am who I am, sent me. Not I am who you think I am. Not I am who you wish I would be. Not I am whom you're molding me into. Not I am who I hope to become one day. I am absolutely who I am. Right now and forevermore, I did not come into being. I am not getting progressively better. There is no lineage to which you can trace my origin. I am, as Francis Schaeffer would say, the God who is absolutely there. That's who sent me. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was. He's the only uncreated reality. 
who is. Look at the text. God is absolutely and completely self-sustained and self-sufficient. Who was, who is, he is right now who he is, and not one of you have helped him be that today. You thought about that? Like, you're struggling, you're frustrated, you have some, you know, uh, some concerns about the, uh, the things that, that, that are in God's word, or you have some concerns about the nature of the political party, blah, blah, or whatever you're, it's like, like you're, you're in your little world, God's ruling the world just fine, and you've helped him do none of it today. Like, none of you woke up today, like, I'm going to have breakfast, take a shower, get ready for church, and help God be God. Like, that's on nobody's punch list today, Right? Because he's absolutely self-sustaining and self-sufficient. Listen to how Paul worded it in Acts chapter 17. He's debating the philosophers of the day. This is Paul on Twitter. <laughs> and he says, okay, you morons. That's in the Greek. Um, <laughs> let me explain this one more time. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. For in him we live and move and have our being. What's Paul saying? Hey, just so you know, all you people who are angry with God, disagreeing with God, explain him away, molding him into your own image, which is idolatry, just so you know, he's the one currently giving you breath to do that. I've been hiking. I've, I, I'm not a hiker. I don't plan on be, being a hiker. I'm hiking for necessity so I don't die as a liability on this trip I mentioned earlier with the boys. So I've been hiking recently, kind of, with a little pack and a little weight, and I emphasize the little and the, and the weight because I'm not a hiker. And I noticed something on a recent hike with my son Levi, who is much more of a hiker than I am. We're climbing up just the, this cow's face ridge line. And, 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 we're, and we're, we're just up off the bottom. And I'm like, are we there yet? And my Strava tells me we've gone about, you know, 11 feet in elevation or something like that. You know, not very far. And we're trying to go to this point. And it hit me. It's, it's like, I am sucking wind, not breathing hard. I am trying to stay alive. Like, like I'm bending trees. And I'm breathing. And I'm, I'm like, I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be okay. And here's what hit me. I can barely struggle up the foothill of a mountain that God spoke into existence. And yet I oftentimes have the audacity to question his wisdom. Isn't that remarkable? How thick-headedly pride-filled, stupid, deceived, moronic, ironic we can be. I know I didn't make this huge mountain. Mountain that I can't really climb up or anything. But I've got, I got some issues with you. As I breathe, you know, the air that you made. And as my heart's beating inside my chest that you made, I got some issues with you. Like I'm lightheaded right now from doing that. Friends, never underestimate your potential for arrogance and pride. The, the, the heart is deceitful above all things. No one can know it. And, and I want you to hear this because, because you know, recently Ro, Roe v. Wade was overturned, and, 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 and so I was, of course, like all of us watching the news and, and watching people's reactions, and, and, and I'll probably write some on it more, uh, later, so you, you know, how should Christians should respond to the cultural moment and and, and we'll talk about it more, but, but as I watched people respond, and I, and I was going to show them, and it's just, I can't, they're, they're, they're too, they're too um, grotesque and evil uh, uh, and, and, and not, not, not proper, but the signs that people were holding in some of these marches made me tremble inside. Because there are signs that mock the holy otherness of God. And, and, and friends, if, if, we don't, if we don't live and, and breathe and pray in such a way to have our hearts and minds reoriented, reoriented to the nature of God and absolute reality, 
we'll start acting the same way in flaunting our rights in the face of the Creator. He's absolutely self-sufficient. J.I. Packer said like this, the Christian must never for one moment imagine himself to be indispensable to God. Isn't that great? Or allow himself to behave as if he were. The God who sent him and is pleased to work with him can absolutely do without him. You ever thought of that? God's so lucky to have me on his team. No, he's not. You're, you're, you're mostly a liability. <laughs> right? I mean, who in the room wants to raise their hand and go, asset, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, kingdom of God, asset. I mean, no, we're all liabilities apart from the grace of God. And in some way in his grace and spirit, he, he saves and he redeems and restores and fills and dwells and empowers and gifts and sends. And in some ways, he, in some miraculous way, he uses us as means of grace to march his kingdom forward. I don't get it. You don't get it. It's above our pay grade to understand. I have good and relatively important work to accomplish today. I'm sure you do as well. Let's give ourselves to our responsibilities and duties with joy. Yes. Let's work as unto the Lord. Yes. But let's not believe even for a nanosecond, this is still J.A. Packer, that the, that the success and accomplishment of God's agenda depends on us. He's pleased to use us, and that is more than amazing, but he can do without us. You see, God has a voluntary relationship to all of his creation. He has no nece necessary relationship to anything outside of himself, which is such wonderful news. Holy, 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 is Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, and then who is to come, he's infinitely eternal. He has no end. He exists outside the constraints of time, regularly blogged about and chipped at by people stu stuck inside the constraints of time with limited access to perspective, which is just a remarkable statement to the breathtaking arrogance of man. So God's nature, ultimate reality, got to hustle here. Hallowed be your name. Second thing that it gives us is it realigns our hearts with God's agenda, ultimate purpose. This will not be nearly as long. Don't be worried. New people are like, ah, I'm going to miss dinner. <coughs> You still might, but it won't be because of me. You might just die on the way home. What? Well, that's true, right? I'm trying to prepare you for eternity. That's what I do. That's how I think about things. That wasn't very encouraging. Well, welcome to reality. When we pray, hallowed be your name, and it realigns our hearts with God's nature and reality and God's agenda and God's ultimate purpose, listen to Revelation 4, verse 9. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne, and then they say, You are worthy, our Lord God, to receive glory and honor and power and praise, for you created all things, purpose clause, you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. What are they saying? What they're telling us here is God's ultimate purpose and agenda. And that is that God is radically committed to himself. And this has been in the engine of Grace City from day one. We talked explicitly about it for the first five or six years. I haven't come back and articulated as explicitly like this in recent days. And so I want to utilize this time now to do so because it's at the foundation of who we are if you're going to understand what makes Grace City tick. We are absolutely delighted by the fact that God is absolutely committed to his name. That God is radically God-centered. That when we say we should live for the glory of God, it only has teeth, it only has bite, it only has foundation underneath it because we're aligning ourselves with God who also lives for the glory of his name. God is not an idolater. He does not worship anyone other than himself. The chief end of God is to glorify himself and enjoy himself forever. And the reason this is important to get right is because there can be subtle heresy that seeps into our Christianity, driven and motivated by good intentions, trying to communicate the love of God for people, that if we're not careful, can reorient people's perspective to think that the center of God's world is man which it most certainly is not. 
which is why you need to listen really closely to well-intended Christian artists writing really lousy, theologically ill-informed songs. God loves people more than anybody. God loves people more than anybody. More than anybody wants us to know. He'd rather die than let us go. God loves people more than anybody. Nice harmony, nice four chords, nice drum beat, bad theology. God doesn't love people more than anything. He loves himself more than anything, and therein lies the only hope he could love you, unworthy as you are as a sinner. This is at the heart of the theology of Grace City Church that keeps us grounded and oriented rightly to the universe that we live in, lest we begin to think that any of this is about us. And here's the subtle error. If you are God-centered... Because if I have a pastor say, you should live for the glory of God, are you like, yay, yes, we should. And then I say, that's good because God lives for the glory of God. You're like, wait a minute. <laughs> if you are God-centered because you believe God is man-centered, you are man-centered. If you are fine living for the glory of God because you believe God lives for the glory of you, you're only using God to get what you would have tried to get apart from being saved, which is namely your own glory. You're still living to promote your own name. You're now just leveraging God as a genie in the sky and a bottle you can rub to get your wish and your commands and your demands, which is my name made great among my town. Here's the question. Whose name do you think will come up at the end of your story? I love movies, love stories. We watch movies as a family all the time, and, we, and my family knows how to watch movies because I've discipled them well. <laughs> you don't talk, chirp, chatter when you get to the end. If the music is swelling, I mean, like, okay, the author has written, directed, created this story, in, included these lines and these words and this angle and this shot and this cinematography and this music and the strains of these chords to get us to this moment. Let's not talk over it while we're eating popcorn. Shush! That's so why I can't watch movies with most people. Oh, yeah, it's a great actor. I saw him in my movie. It's like, shut up. I'll watch that movie later. I'm watching this movie right now. And I don't want to be reminded that they're in a train wreck in real life. I want, to, I want to think that right now they can fly jets. You know what I mean? Let's just watch this, okay? I could absolutely suspend reality to enjoy a show for three hours. 100%. Where was I going with this? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think you should use notes more. Well, <laughs> go plant your own church. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, that, was, that was mean. I'm sorry. <laughs> Tired. Third time's a charm. Let's be done. Lunch is coming. <laughs> Whose story are you in? There it is. <laughs> Whose name? Thank you, Brian. At the end of the movie, credits start to roll, right? Produced by, written by, directed by, shot by, starring role. And unconsciously, you and I think that at the end of our story, the, the best way for it to work out would be, you know, um, co-produced by God and Josh. Directed by God. Parenthetical comment, mostly Josh. Starring Josh, leading role up for an Emmy Award for co-actor of the year, Jesus. Supporting, what do you call co-actor? Supporting role, supporting actor, you know, number two guy. I went to Hastings when it closed, um, and uh, they, they, were, they were having a, a fire sale, and I walked in, boxes and stacks and rows of movies. Now, the, oh, this is awesome. I'll walk away with some good deals. A couple bucks for DVDs. Can we get fill out our library? It's going to be awesome. I spent two hours waiting through garbage. And I left without a single DVD with this thought in mind. There's a lot of bad movies out there. I don't mean bad like you shouldn't watch them with a clear conscience bad. I mean just like terrible. You know what I mean? Like, like bad writing, bad producing, bad acting, terrible score, lousy cinematography, lousy storyline. Just like, like, like those stories are so bad, Hastings couldn't give them away. You know what I mean? 30% off, 70% off, 80% off. We'll pay you to take them. <laughs> That's your story 
apart from God's involvement. It comes, it goes, it ends, it's over, and Hastings couldn't sell it if they were trying to give it away. You see, when the world ends, it's going to be written by God, produced by God, directed by God, starring God. And you have a choice. You can demand to be in your own story where you get all the credit at the end and then it's over and forgotten forever and gone to the trash heap of history. Or you can have the honor of being playing a small tertiary role in this epic trilogy that God is writing, a new hope, return of the kingdom, and the kingdom strikes back, and all these other things that God's writing. Lousy joke, didn't work. I'd personally rather be a part of the story that lasts forever than the ones forgotten, which means God's name better, better come up as first in your story. Now, could I prove this biblically? I'm going to do this quickly. My guess is you've never thought of it like this, but friends, once you hear it, once you see it, it's all you can see in Holy Scripture. This is the, the, the unfettered and crystal clear revelation of God that he does all things for himself, that he is most passionately committed to the glory of his name, that he is not passively sitting by hoping he gets glory. He is actively orchestrating all things so that he wins glory. And if you're going to be serious about living for God's glory, that needs to be your taproot. So let's look at it briefly in the survey of redemptive history as we close. Creation. This is the question. Why did God create everything? Here's the answer. The heavens declare what? <laughs> the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them in the rest of the verse, in which language can't be understood. The point being, he's saying, there's no tribe that exists in Papua New Guinea that can't look around the jungle and the vines and the earth and the sun and the sky and go, there's a God who made that. The, the, the visible evidence of his invisible powers made clear in creation. And God did all of that so as to declare his glory. Mountains, rocks, trees, blue lakes, brown wall, rivers, all exist to declare the glory of God, full stop. You don't look at a mountain and go, man, Josh is incredible. <laughs> if you do, you, you, someone slap you. You know what I mean? It's like, you look at a mountain and you're like, wow, who made that? God Almighty. Creation exists to express the glory and power and to draw forth from creation adoration of God. How about incarnation? Let's talk about why Jesus came. Certainly, God sent Jesus for us. And there were shepherds living in the fields nearby, keeping watch over the flocks by night. The angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. Anybody heard this verse? You missed the point of this verse until just now. Watch, I'll read it. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid, bring good tidings, great joy, blah, blah, all the people, swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, yada, yada, yada. Verse 13 Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared to the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest of heavens. What's the point? We're here at the center of redemptive history, and God sends a legion of angels to make sure nobody misses the point of this event. The glory of God on earth. Jesus shows up, the God-man in swaddling clothes, and the angels are there to say, God, get your glory from this boy. That's what Christmas is about, the glory of God. How about predestination? Oh, I don't like that word. It's in the Bible, so get over it. Ephesians 1, verse 6. He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with the pleasure of his will to the praise of his glorious grace. Or quite literally, to the praise of the glory of his grace. The phrase used two more times in, in Ephesians 1. Here's one more example. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. Get this, no accident. In order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be to the praise of the glory of his grace. Three times, Paul links the predestining, pre-planning, pre-orchestrated work of God in salvation to him ensuring that he gets glory for the grace he would extend to sinful fallen man. God was not passively sitting by hoping he gets glory for salvation, God is decisively acting so as to get glory for his grace in salvation. How about 
Justification, Romans 3. Why did Jesus have to die? God loves people more than anything, or anything he wants us to know. He'd rather die than let us go. Eh. Romans 3, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement, or the propitiation for sins through the shed of his blood to be received by faith. He did this so as to demonstrate, this is the purpose clause, his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. What is Paul saying? Don't miss it. He's saying the reason God the Father sent God the Son to become the propitiation for or the atoning sacrifice for your sins was to vindicate himself in the unrighteous act of forgiving David hundreds of years earlier for raping Bathsheba and murdering her husband. Because God forgave David when he requested forgiveness and the the Bible screams, Proverbs, it's an abomination to justify the wicked because it's a violation of holy justice and God was doing it every day, which means God had a problem in that he was violating his own holy nature in forgiving sinners and drawing them into a saving relationship and issuing salvation for their sins. And there had been no sacrifice made or cost paid to cover the wages their sin incurred. That's unholy justice unless there could be one who could be both the just and the justifier. Enter the man Jesus Christ. The cross of Christ is about God justifying and vindicating himself and his holy righteousness in extending unwarranted and unearned favor and grace to you as a sinner. Why did God send Jesus? To vindicate himself. Because his love and grace and kindness are holy. And the, the purity and righteousness of his nature must be upheld. How about sanctification? Why am I supposed to grow in my faith? God saves us wherever we're at, which is glorious. God is the God who is open to all, coming through one gate. He says, this is my prayer, Paul's writing, that you, your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth and insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Filled with the fruit of the righteousness that comes from Christ. What is he? He's praying, for, he's, like, he's like, I pray that you might grow up in your faith. I pray you'd stop being bitter and backbiting and gossiping and slandering and not forgiving people and being petty. I pray that you, you might be godly and kind and gracious and walk and, and increasingly so the spirit and the attitudes and the character of Christ. And I'm praying all of that to the glory and praise of God. This is my prayer, that you might be sanctified for God's glory. Not that your conscience might be clear or you might grow sweet in, 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 your, in, your, in your old age, not bitter in your old age, that you might be nicer to be around. No, I'm praying that you might be sanctified to make me look better as you carry my name into your day. How about ecclesiology? Oh, I got, we're out of, I, I got, we got to wrap this up. You write that verse down. I'm going to read it. I'm going to read it. I'm going to read it. Do it. Dear friends, I urge you. No, no. <laughs> to stay until I'm done. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, so that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Dear friends, I urge you. Watch this. You are not a people of God, not even made a people of God, rich in his mercy. I urge you to abstain from the sinful desires which war wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, hear this, though they blog about you and tweet about you and spread all sorts of falsities about you, though they accuse you of being unloving and, and unkind and hate-filled and bigoted and all blah, 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 though they accuse you, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Friends, don't be beaten down by the mob so that you cave in relationship to absolute reality of who God is. That's not loving anyone. Caving and giving in and affirming people's self-built delusions in their alter realities they're building is not love. There is a holy God 
who will bring ultimate reality thundering down on all of our heads on Judgment Day, and there's one way to survive, and it's to be found in Christ. And how is it, why is there a church? So God gets glory. Eschatology, this last one I promise, we'll end with this. Probably not, but I'll just say that so you keep listening. <laughs> Second Thessalonians verse 1, verse 9 of chapter 1. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. On that day when he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who believe. Do you get that? Why is Jesus bothering to come back? He's coming back so he can be marveled at. He's not coming back so he can highlight the all-stars on his team. He's coming back so he can be marveled at as the one all-glorious, unchanging, self-sustaining, morally perfect and pure and permanent and uncaused being in all of the universe. And friends, when God's name is rolling up at the end of your story, produced by, written by, directed by, starring Jesus, friends, your life is a sweet thing. We say we live for the glory of God because we joyfully affirm that God lives for the glory of God. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Here's the thought I had this week. Sharon and I are parents of four of the most extraordinary kids I've ever met in my life. I love these dear sweet souls. <laughs> Sometimes I'm like, oh Lord, sorry they're in our family. <laughs> that sounds weird, but you're like, you ever, you ever paranoid of screwing your kids up? Is that, is I'm the only parent that thinks that? Oh, I saw parents over there. Oh, yeah, Lord, help us. Sharon and I are regularly concerned for the future of our kids, mostly because we're around us a lot. <laughs> right? And we're like, man, we know. We're a train wreck, man. Oh, Lord. Lord, save our kids, help our kids, fill our kids, protect our kids from the world, from us. You know, just do your thing. And here's what hit me this week. Of all the things I could try to teach my kids and impart to my kids and show my kids and train my kids in, which is a lot, and we're in the game, we're trying, and we fall short all the time, and we need a lot of grace from the king who is kind. But it hit me this week. If I could some way help my kids see what I've been seeing and experiencing in my life, which I think they are, and if I could some way like, lead them to, okay, I'm here, like, let's look at him. If they could see Jesus and if you bump my kids, if what comes out of them is, hallowed be your name, they're good. If I could get my kids before the throne, it's like, wow, he's amazing. He's incredible. Hallowed be his name. We're good. They'll figure the rest out. This isn't preamble to the importance of God getting us our daily bread. This is reorienting our heart to absolute realities flowing from the divine and absolute nature of God, that his name is to be hallowed in all the earth. And when you, when you get out of line with, with that prayer and that reality, it's only destruction. You're off the trail in the bushes. You, you want to stay in line with reality, you keep in your heart, hallowed be your name, and you say it until you believe it. And so thank you, Father, for helping orient our heart back to the nature of God and ultimate realities and your agenda and our ultimate purpose to align ourselves with your passion for your glory. Father, I pray even in these moments as we as a church lift our voice in worship and come to your communion table that you would gently, tenderly, sweetly, personally meet each person and that our love for you would increase as we experience your love for us because of your passion for your glory. Lord, the Grace Seed Church would be a place where people are passionate about one name, living for one name, lifting up one name, glorifying one name, drawing attention to one name. That we would experience the joy of living for the purpose in which we were created, namely to exalt and worship and declare the praises and enjoy the glory of the one true living God. And Father, would that be the lens through which we look all of life? And as we come to you in prayer and conversation this week as our good, precious, dear, and near Heavenly Father, would the words, Father, hallowed be your name, be on our lips. 
Father, revere your name in my life. Glorify your name in my life. Exalt your name in my life. Do what you must to ensure you get glory for your name from my life. Would that be the heart, Father, I pray, the heartbeat and the heart cry of the people of Grace City Church. In Jesus' name, amen.